you ever had a time in your life when you've been praying about something and God answers in such an amazing way that you know it's from God and it shapes your life for future? King Jehoshaphat is a king who made a terrible mistake and God answered his prayer and it shaped his life and how he led the people of God. And I want us to look at his life for a couple of minutes. There's a particular battle that takes place to think about what does it mean for us as we face life's challenges? How do we face them from a kingdom perspective? The chronicler who's writing, and we call the chronicler the chronicler because we don't know who he is, but he's writing in a time after the Israelites have gone back to Jerusalem when there is no king. They're no longer facing battles because the Persians are ruling over them. They have become the minority, not the majority. And the chronicler is writing to teach God's people and to teach us what does it mean to face life's challenges when you're the minority, not the majority? And how do you respond with a kingdom perspective? I love the book of Chronicles. And I make no apologies for it. I'm writing a commentary on Chronicles, and I do my work in Genesis, and people often said, when I talk about Genesis, they go, oh, I love Genesis. And then when I say, oh, and I'm writing a commentary on Chronicles, and they look like, Chronicles? If you haven't read Chronicles, read it. It is a powerful, powerful book. So let's talk about King Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. What happens is... It opens with, it says, now it came about after this, and there's some enemies that start to come against King Jehoshaphat. The after this is after great acts of faithfulness in the preceding chapter. Why is that important? It underscores that sometimes conflict can take place even when we've been doing the right thing and when we've been serving God. What we find out from this is that in the kingdom of God, God calls us to be a blessing to the nations, but there is also going to be seasons of conflict because the nations don't hold the same priorities as the kingdom of God. And if you in your own life, we've had our two boys that were brought up in a, went to a charter school in Salem, only Christian kids. Sometimes there are times when there's conflict with the other cultures around us, when we've got to stand firm. Jehoshaphat's in one of these situations. He's got enemies coming against him about 30 miles away, and it says here in verse 3, Jehoshaphat was afraid because there was a great multitude coming against him. What did Jehoshaphat do? This is what it says. And Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast. Do you realize how odd that is? King Jehoshaphat is a military guy. He has his army stationed in Jerusalem. He has his troops in Jerusalem. And in fact, the early one of the first things he did when he was king was he set up his military. Why doesn't Jehoshaphat call up his army. And what does it mean to seek the Lord? Jehoshaphat understood that a king is not saved by the strength of his army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory, Psalm 33. What does this mean? The psalmist says, our soul waits for the Lord. We hope in God. And I want to suggest as we get started that a student is not saved by the strength of her GPA. A student is not delivered by talents, gifts, academic abilities, athletic abilities. A high GPA is a false hope for victory. You can have the high GPA, you can have the athletic ability, you can have the dance ability, but if you rely on them, it is idolatry. And it is not the posture of the kingdom. When we start to rely on these things other than God, it is idolatry. And Jehoshaphat had an army, but he did not rely on it. What did he do? 
I want you to notice here that there are two different verbs about what it means to seek the Lord. Verse 3, Jehoshaphat was afraid and he turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast. And then verse 4, all Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. There are two different verbs here, and it's important. The first one is used when Rebecca is pregnant and she hears, feels something rumbling and she inquires of the Lord. That verb is about asking God, what is God doing? So here, the enemy's coming against Jehoshaphat, and what does he do? He asks God what God is doing. And in fact, this verb about seeking God is a hallmark of what it means to be in the kingdom of God. The verb appears five times in Genesis, once in Exodus, once in Leviticus, three times in 1 and 2 Samuel, 41 times in Chronicles. The chronicler is, and God through him, is wanting to say to us, when you're in the kingdom of God, a hallmark of the value of the kingdom is seeking God and finding out and asking him what he's doing. And letting go of all the other things to say to God, God, what are you doing in my life right now? Second verb is about seeking someone when they, you can't find them. When Joseph is looking for his brothers, he is seeking them. Remember when he goes out wandering, that's seeking. And there are numerous examples when someone in Esther, in the court where they seek Esther, they're seeking for a woman among all the women. Seeking God, the second term, takes effort. But God says, if you seek me, I will be found by you. Requires effort. And here we have Jehoshaphat doing this when he's facing great circumstances. Have you ever wondered why, how someone gets to be like this? If you've got someone who's like a, a spiritual leader and a mentor, have you ever wondered how they got that way? King Jehoshaphat learned this through a major mistake in his life. What happened? Just two chapters earlier, he'd been very successful. He had his military, he had wealth, and King Ahab... Uh, the northern king asks him to join in this battle with him. And so when he gets there, Ahab has two thrones set up, one for Jehoshaphat and one for Ahab. And they've got royal garments on, and, and Jehoshaphat loves it. And they're about to go into battle, and they inquire of the Lord, the same verb used in our passage. And he King Jehoshaphat says, well, we've got the enemies coming. Why don't we inquire of the Lord and see what God wants to say about it? So they bring in prophets. There are 400 prophets. The prophets all are in front of them. Imagine the scene. They've got their royal garments on, like the garments when you have faculty processions. You know, those beautiful, expensive robes. That's what they're wearing. There's been a great feast for Jehoshaphat. He loves it all. 400 prophets say you're going to have success in the battle. And Jehoshaphat says to himself, you know, um, is there another prophet around? And Ahab says, well, I've got this other prophet, Micaiah, but I really don't like what he has to say. He doesn't have anything good to say about me. <laughs> so Jehoshaphat says, why don't you go and get him? So here's what happens. While they're going to get the prophet, the 400 other prophets start getting horns and they start ramming each other showing symbolically that they're going to have success. Micaiah comes in. The messenger who goes out to see Micaiah says, by the way, we've already said he's going to have success. So you need to say the same thing. And he says, I will say what the Lord will tell me. Thanks very much. Goes in front of them. They say, what's going to happen? He said, yes, uh, you're going to have victory. And then they said, well, really, what is going to happen? And he has a vision and he says, I see all Israel scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And he's telling them, you're not going to win the battle. And you know what Jehoshaphat does? He goes out anyway. 
He goes out to battle, and you know what else he does? Ahab says, oh, by the way, uh, why don't you wear the royal garments and I'll disguise myself? And he does, because he's flattered by it. So he goes out, and guess what happens? The enemy starts thinking that he's the king of Israel, and they start chasing after him. And he must be thinking to himself, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. And what does he do? He cries out to God for help. And God hears his prayer, and he's saved, and it changes his life. Now, when the enemy is coming against him, first thing he does is seek the Lord. See, that's battle-tested king, and that's a battle-tested kingdom perspective. What about you? Have you ever had times when you are seeking God and you've had an answer in your life? Someone was asking me yesterday, how do you know? I said, you keep seeking God. You keep seeking him because he promises that whatever you are going through, that if you seek me, I will be found by you. A number of years ago, when I was um, back in Australia, I was at Bible college, and I'd been praying about what God would have me do for the rest of my life. Seeking the Lord for several months, and my home church had asked me to be the youth pastor there, associate pastor, and I thought that could be a good thing. Then felt God say no. After several months, I woke up at five o'clock in the morning and felt God say to me, I want you to study overseas. Now, I'm from Australia. People in Australia like to stay in Australia. That's just kind of how it goes. We don't have the winters like you have here. A word from God after seeking him. What happened? It wasn't something I necessarily wanted to do. I was afraid of it. Why was I afraid? I'd been at Bible college. I had left school when I was 14. Didn't graduate from high school. Worked in my mum's businesses for 10 years. Became a Christian. And God called me, to, I thought, to study the Bible for one year. Started off as a diploma student because I didn't have a degree. Fell in love with the scriptures. Started to take another year, and then someone, and I just, God stirred in me a love for the scriptures, and then someone said, my professor said, you've got to study Greek. <laughs> I'm like, oh gosh. So I started, I hated my first year of Greek. I said, I really love the Old Testament, and then the professor said, you've got to learn Hebrew. So I learned Hebrew. And then God was calling me to further study, and I was afraid. I was also fearful because it any decision that you make, it requires faith. It requires faith. And I was also concerned about the whole finances and had been praying for months. And I told some of you yesterday that I, before I left Australia, sold my car and left family, gave away my dog. <laughs> I now have a golden doodle puppy, which is very cute. <laughs> but what happened in that, over those few months, I continued to pray, and in the end, I thought, oh, it's not going to work because I don't have the finances. It wasn't all coming through. I'd been praying. I'd been asking God. I'd been reading George Mueller. Don't talk to people about your finances. Just pray about it. And then right at the end, I uh, wrote this letter to Gordon Conwell, and I said, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. I was late at night. I was crying. I was like, Lord, what are you doing? And I was led to the scripture, faithful is he who has called you, and he will bring it to pass. I wrote the letter. The next day, I saw a friend of mine that I had roomed with. I was living with homeless uh, kids. And she said, oh, by the way, you got a letter. I said, what's the letter? From Gordon Conwell. I opened up the letter, and I'd received a scholarship, full tuition scholarship. Amen, right? But 
Does everyone receive a scholarship? No. But does God answer prayer if you set your face to seek him? He absolutely does. And the one thing that I would encourage you today, with Jehoshaphat, God ends up answering this prayer. Wonderful, you saw it read. They end up going out into battle. They start, the prophet gives an answer, and the prophet says that the battle's not yours, but God's, and answer's coming. The prophet gives them the word, and they listen. They get up early in the morning. He gets the singers. They, they also fall flat on their faces in worship. When you've had an answer to prayer, you get worshiping down real low. They go out to battle, and, and as they go out, they start singing and praising God before the battle has been won. And they come back victorious. God doesn't promise us military victories today. But he does answer prayer, and a hallmark of the kingdom is seeking the face of God. And I would encourage you, the one thing I would encourage you to do, my two boys are freshmen at Gordon College. Some of you that age and some older. Start a prayer journal if you haven't done it yet. I started this when I was at Bible College some over 25 years ago. Quick prayer journal, things that I'm praying about. It is the best thing I have ever done in my Christian life. And the second thing I would encourage you to do is pray with others. Jehoshaphat's not on his own in this. There's a whole community, and the Spirit of God comes in the context of community to speak to bring encouragement to the king. So I don't know what circumstances you are facing today. Whether you're thinking about what God has in terms of your future, or whether there's things that you're struggling with in your family, in relationships, but I would encourage you to set your face to seek the Lord. Leave aside CVs. Leave aside your GPAs. Spend the time seeking the Lord and asking others to do so. And just like when a parent hides from their child and says, come find me, they are hiding because they want to be found. And God wants to be found by you. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.